Good evening, everybody. I'm Michael Aaron, senior political correspondent at NJN News, with two esteemed colleagues from the media, Josh Margolin, who uh, made his name at the Newark Star-Ledger in this state, but is now at the New York Post, and Ted Sherman, who continues to make his name at the New York Star-Ledger, <laughs> and most recently uh, did the series on the Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission, which may not mean a whole lot to people down here, but it sure meant a lot to Chris Christie <laughs> because he went after it and uh, uh, sort of turned it upside down, and about 100 people fell out and haven't gotten back up yet, which is what this book is somewhat about. It's about the downfall of a number of people who were not expecting to be taken down and who have all or many gone to prison as a result and whose lives have been ruined. Um, and you all remember, I'm sure, what triggered this book or the incident that this book is all about. Uh, the mass bust uh, on a day in July in 2009 of political figures, mainly in northern New Jersey, and rabbis from the shore, from Brooklyn, from the Orthodox community. Uh, these two guys decided to write a book about that case, and I want to start by asking them why. Josh, why, why did you write a book about this case? Because nobody understood what happened, why it happened, when it first happened in July 09. Ted and I were as close to it as anybody who wasn't handcuffed. And, and, frankly, and, and frankly, we didn't understand it. We're, we, we come into the office on, on a, a muggy July morning, having been tipped off the night before that something big, quote unquote, was going to come down. And in New Jersey, there's always something big, and there's always a politician getting arrested, and there's always a corruption case. But my god. We're there, and, and we're getting reports from our, from our colleagues that are, that are out, in the, you know, out at the FBI headquarters or down in Deal or in Brooklyn. And it's a dozen politicians. It's two dozen. You have Hasidic rabbis in their long black coats with their ritual fringes flowing in, in the breeze. You have the deputy mayor of Jersey City who, who shows up you know, handcuffed, she's 70 years old, and she's wearing a low-cut dress. What are these characters? What is this? What has well, happened? Well, she was a former burlesque queen. And so that's that a whole <laughs> different story, but we don't even know that. All we knew is that we have this really well-put-together business lady from Jersey City, deputy mayor, and she's getting perp-walked. And we hear that there's an informant in the middle of it, and the feds won't say who it is. And, and no one understands, the first day no one understands how it how it came together, and then when you finally find out, when we finally found out what it was that tied everything together and led to these arrests, we still didn't understand it. Why would anybody, to take you back, why would anybody trust Solomon Dweck? He had been arrested already on a $50 million bank fraud. And we'll go through the details, which are extraordinarily hilarious and stupid and sad, but he had been arrested already. And people are taking bribes from him and laundering his money as if somehow he's not wired by the feds. Let me, let me, stop, let me stop you there because we, we've got to get into Dweck because Dweck is at the heart of this story. Who would play Dweck when they make the movie <laughs> of this, by the way? It's a good question because the whole story of, of the Jersey thing is very cinematic. And, and most reporters, when, when they're sitting in a courtroom looking, you know, looking, waiting for a case to develop, We'll cast a movie just sitting there, and we we did the same thing. So who's Dweck? Oh, uh, you know George Costanza, the guy who. Uh... <laughs> uh, and he's from Jersey, so that would actually help <laughs> with the accent, the whole thing. What's most amazing um, is that Solomon Dweck, at, in his late twenties, I guess. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this whole thing got started when he went through a PNC bank in Monmouth County, uh, went through the drive through window and passed a bad check for $25 million. You mean you don't do that? Uh, it's even better than that. It wasn't a bad check. It was a $25 million check on a closed account. 
and the bank cashed it at the drive-thru. Well, they didn't give him cash. No, but they what gave... What did they do? They, 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 they put, they, they put they, $25 million into his account. And, and, and under the bank uh, protocol at PNC, once you deposit a check, as a customer, your funds are available immediately. Immediately. So what did he do? Within, within hours, he, he transferred all the money out, and then the next day he tried to do it again. Which is what any of us would do. If he gave me $25 million, you would then go and do it again. Uh, up until that point, he was the son of a rabbi in Deal, part of the Syrian Jewish community that has taken over the town of Deal. Uh, and he had built a huge Ponzi scheme, correct? That was Solomon's secret life. Solomon was known as a philanthropist. He was known as, as the son of a rabbi. He was very, very successful buying properties all over Ocean and, and Monmouth counties. And what nobody realized at the time was that it was all a Ponzi scheme. He was, he was a mini Bernie Madoff. He had lots of of investors who, who were promised huge returns. And the way he did that was he was buying properties. And he was getting mortgages for these properties. And sometimes he was getting mortgages for properties he did not own. Sometimes he was getting mortgages for properties he said he was going to buy that he already bought. And, and this went on for, for years. Um, the, ba the banks kind of look ridiculous in this book. Yes, do they, they do. Not? Yes, they do. They don't do any due diligence on all these. All on the mortgage on my <laughs> <laughs> And in fact, he, sa he said that in, in, you know, eventually he ends up in bankruptcy court, and he's, he's deposed about this. And he said, yes, the banks did no due diligence, and any excuse he gave them normally was accepted. If, if a bank Isn't quit that amazing? It, it was just astounding to us. You know, I, I, if, if I don't pay my mortgage... You hear from uh, the bank. Exactly, exactly. Um, in the book, uh, you write that... Well, uh, Ted just made the, uh, the analogy to Bernie Madoff, but uh, you wrote at one point in the book that although he was running a massive Ponzi scheme, and I think you say that he had built up $310 million worth of debt at, at one point, at the point where he needs the $25 million to pay somebody, you write that nonetheless the people he victimized uh, weren't as angry at him as Bernie Madoff's victims were at him because, you write, he had a kind of charisma. What, what, so had, talk about that. A, Solomon Dweck had a tremendous amount of charisma, and it's not the charisma that's born of the dapper, dashing, good-looking actor or public figure. He, he certainly is none of those. We're talking about a guy who's, who approaches six foot. He's pudgy. He's balding. I, I, I'm pudgy and balding also, but I'm not, I, don't, I don't look like a, a movie star. He, he just doesn't appear to be a physical presence. But still, he, he manages to, to get people to to believe in him, to trust in him, to have faith in him. And, and the, the, the root of his charisma is something that we all can understand from our own personal lives, given whatever faith you might, you might have. It's the simple phrase, he was the rabbi's son. And by being the rabbi's son, that cloak that he wore through, through no doing of his own, frankly, w was able to give him immediate integrity, or at least this, this patina of integrity, where people felt, so even at the end, he's, he's arrested, and the scandal is beginning to come out day by day, revelation by revelation. The state judge on the case assigns a lawyer to be a special fiscal monitor to start unwrapping all of this. The monitor meets with the individual victims, and one after another, they still trust Solomon. Oh, he wouldn't do anything wrong. He didn't mean it. He must have had a problem. These are all the victims of his Ponzi scheme, not the victims of his going undercover for no, the FBI. No, no, abs absolutely not. No, those guys have a different <laughs> feeling about him. No, um, 
no, he, this is this is this, this is, is people like his uncle this Joey. Is, or yes, uncle well, Joey. his uncle Joey is a different case because, as we tell in the Who, Jersey, how much State, money did he swindle from his uncle 60, Joey? Sixty million dollars from his uncle Joey. Sixty million dollars. Sixty million dollars. Where did Joey get sixty million dollars? Joey is a very successful man in the garment industry.